I'm going to be focusing mostly on um, how we can change actor surveillance protocols in 2021 using the tools that we have at hand. Um, and really um, integrating MRI fusion biopsy into your active surveillance uh, protocol using the best evidence. Um, so that brings up the question, you know, do we need to even do systematic biopsy either at the diagnostic setting or uh, at the confirmatory setting? Um, what is the evidence-based uh, continued surveillance protocol here that we use and in our VA, and what are special considerations and pitfalls? So uh, really this focuses on two questions. One is how do we safely expand the active surveillance criteria beyond the traditional Epstein criteria for very low risk disease? And equally important, how can we safely reduce invasive uh, surveillance procedures uh, without sacrificing outcomes and an increased patient compliance? So one of the best studies at the diagnostic setting is uh, this UCLA paired cap study uh, where they took 300 men that were biopsy naive, 248 men had pyrads, uh, three or greater lesions. They did both systematic cognitive fusion and a, uh, a software fusion using the uh, Artemis system. They found that with a combined approach, uh, uh, it was the best available uh, accuracy. If they used a single approach, they would have missed 11 to, to, uh, to 33 percent of their uh, clinically significant prostate cancers. Um, the cancer detection rate also, even with MRI fusion, tracked closely with what Dr. Godoy's point was, the uh, PSA density. So uh, above 0.15, uh, they, they uh, caught many more cancers than below 0.1. So I think that's always an important consideration. Don't forget the basics. This was very similar to a French trial card called the uh, MIR, MRI first trial. So, um, and recently uh, the NCI updated their series in the New England Journal of Medicine. Uh, they published this last year. Um, very large series. They really led the country in the United States uh, as far as MRI fusion goes. Uh, they were using NFIRE Philips uh, ultrasound machine, just like I use at our VA, uh, with up to five targets biopsied. Um, their uh, detection rates, uh, if only MRI uh, targeted biopsy was performed, they would have missed uh, 8% of Gleason grade three cancers uh, uh, or, or, or higher even. Um, if they admitted the systematic biopsy. So again, this uh, illustrates the important role uh, of continuing to use uh, the tools that we have at hand from before, the systematic biopsy. Uh, this is compared to their radical prostatectomy specimens. So 404 of these men went on to have radical prostatectomy, and you can see how with systematic biopsy alone, this is a traditional number of upgrading around 30 to 40 percent occurs uh, at the time of uh, pathologic examination. If they use targeted biopsy, uh, a smaller percentage, but the best approach is a combined approach. All right, so um, can we conf uh, forego confirmatory biopsy then? Uh, that's the next, the next question. Um, I think the evidence is very strong that you can need to continue to do confirmatory biopsy. And if you're using MRI fusion, you need to do that combined with a systematic biopsy as well. So up to 19 to 45 percent of clinically significant prostate cancers will be missed with fusion biopsy alone if used at the confirmatory uh, biopsy stage. Uh, why is that? Well, that's because we miss in different areas with different uh, techniques. So uh, two different studies, one published out of the Netherlands, one published out of Denmark, and uh, they showed almost exactly the same thing with these heat maps that, you know, MRI biopsy tends to miss at the dorsolateral lesions. These are the areas that we biopsy traditionally using a systematic biopsy, and uh, the uh, systematic biopsy misses in the anterior lesion. Oh, let's go back. MRI uh, uh, tends to hit these anterior targets that we tend to miss with a systematic biopsy. So um, there really are complementary techniques, uh, in my opinion. Okay, so how often do you need to repeat biopsies? This was a nice modeling study that was published in Cancer. Um, the uh, the frequency of, of, of uh, or the percentage of metastasis at 20 years and, uh, and, and, metas uh, and metastatic disease w along with prostate cancer death varies based upon the cohort's baseline risk. So Johns Hopkins, JHU, has a historically very low risk because of their strict entry criteria. 
whereas PASS, Toronto, and UCSF are higher. Um, but what was shown across the board, despite the differences in baseline risk, is that you really have a very marginal benefit from uh, uh, increasing your biopsy frequency more than every three to four years, uh, and even up to annual. So uh, three to four years is, is, is probably the right uh, amount to do your surveillance biopsy. So what are the special scenarios? One thing that comes up very often is the high, uh, high volume uh, Gleason grade group one. So uh, the NCCN, AUA, ASTRO, SUO guidelines are very clear in defining their very low risk disease. Um, uh, and they do uh, uh, discuss volume progression. So greater number of cores involved and greater extent of core involvement. We know that both increase in number of positive cores and increase in percent core involvement uh, are strongly associated with later grade progression. So these are guys that you wouldn't necessarily trigger treatment in, but you need to follow very closely. And this is the Toronto cohort. So uh, this is 732 men that were followed for 10 to 15 years. They did include intermediate risk patients in their cohort, but these were the ones that ended up having unfavorable outcomes in terms of metastatic uh, disease. So uh, there is a statistically significant difference in metastasis-free survival between the, the grade group two and grade group three uh, uh, patients uh, compared to the grade group one patients. So controversial whether or not uh, you should include in intermediate risk patients, but if you do, um, I would argue that this is a, a very good uh, opportunity to use uh, genomic testing. So this is a paper I published with uh, Eric Klein's group. Um, these, uh, let me just run through the figure real quick. So the GPS stratifies these Gleason score seven patients very well. And you can see that there's an inflection point around 30 for both their absolute risk of metastasis and their uh, absolute risk of prostate cancer specific mortality. So patients that fall above this 30 benchmark, I would consider uh, moving on to just treatment. Okay, special scenarios. So active surveillance for African-American men. This is very con uh, common uh, at our VA because the African-American population is overrepresented. And uh, Canary Pass shows that there's no difference in progression or treatment-free survival within six years for these, uh, for these men uh, compared to their Caucasian counterparts. So um, uh, it is very appropriate to include African-American men in your, in your active surveillance cohorts, but we know traditionally from SEER data that African-Americans are under-enrolled about half as often as Caucasian uh, counterparts. So this is my algorithm for the VA. Uh, basically, we start with a systematic truss biopsy. We don't do an MRI initially. Uh, this, this cuts out uh, a large par pa part of the population that's both intermediate and high risk to begin with. We tend to encourage uh, immediate treatment for those patients. Those patients that are low risk, we will continue to, do, to follow with an MRI, uh, MRI of the prostate and to do a, a systematic and uh, fusion biopsy. Uh, at the confirmatory setting for these patients. We'll follow them uh, and do surveillance biopsies every two to three years, or if there's changes in their PSA density uh, or DRE. So, all right, ready for our case presentation. So this is uh, sort of our panel discussion. 65-year-old uh, African-American male, otherwise health healthy, presents in 2017 with an elevated PSA, no family history of prostate cancer, uh, uh, but uh, his, given his, his uh, size of gland and the elevation in his PSA, that puts his PSA density at 0.21. Um, he undergoes a biopsy in 2017 with focal high-grade pin, uh, uh, followed uh, in 2018 with, again, another elevation in his PSA, he gets an MRI in 2018 following that PSA that shows in the left transition zone anterior lesion that's pyrides 5. Uh, a repeat systematic biopsy with a cognitive fusion, because we didn't have the uronav system at that point, uh, is benign with only three cores of high-grade pin. His PSA continues to rise, and again, we repeat the MRI to uh, monitor this lesion. The lesion's grown into pyrides 5 with possible extra prostatic extension. So this is the T2 weighted imaging. This is your uh, uh, diffusion weighted imaging. You can see the lesion nicely uh, lighting up. And then this is your ADC map. So you have signal loss with the ADC map. We do a uh, uronav fusion biopsy. This is obviously a, an area that you would not hit with a, a typical systematic biopsy, but we can nicely target it with the uronav uh, system. 
And it comes back, Gleason, uh, Gleason score three plus four. He elects to undergo radical prostatectomy. There's tertiary pattern five, uh, and there is extra prostatic extension um, on the radical prostatectomy specimen, uh, but he does well postoperatively. His PSA is undetectable, patient is continent. Uh, any points of discussion there? I think that that sort of highlights the, the need to use both systematic biopsy, but using a, uh, a fusion guidance system. So I know that on the private side, we're using the Artemis system, but the UNF system is, is what I have the most experience with. I think that really is an improvement over cognitive fusion and something that's been demonstrated in the literature as well. Uh, we need to introduce Dr. Cadman uh, as a uh, full professor at Baylor College of Medicine, and he previously uh, did his training at Wash U in both residency and fellowship. and. Uh, has extensive experience uh, using the Artemis system for prostate biopsy. And Dr. Cabin, can you comment uh, on this, and, and Dr. Godoy as well, can you comment on this particular case on the need to use both modalities to get accurate uh, diagnosis characterization and to do early detection, as well as the, the potential appearance of more than one uh, Gleason grade in, in a series of biopsies and how important it is to really characterize the patient's risk. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, this case illustrates very nicely that if you follow just basic principles and basic blood tests with PSA and your own uh, intuition as to what it tells you, this is a patient that you suspect has a cancer. You couldn't prove it with a regular systematic biopsy, but you could clearly see it and prove it with the MRI. Uh, I use the Artemis system, and routinely, uh, when I do an MRI fusion, I also add the 12 random systematic biopsies. Uh, I think Dr. Brooks mentioned, and correctly so, uh, those are uh, complementary uh, biopsies because of the regions of the prostate they reflect, um, and uh, clearly, uh, you need to use both, in my opinion. And the data are there to support it. Oh, in terms of multiple uh, grades, uh, of course, I mean, prostate cancer is heterogeneous, and you can find Gleason 3 plus 3 in one area, but that doesn't necessarily prove that you have ruled out Gleason 3 plus 4 or higher uh, adjacent to it or in the op um, contralateral lobe. And we know this from experience of many years. So even if we identify low-grade disease, we still have to be vigilant and that's the topic of active surveillance. Yeah, I'm just going to add that, uh, uh, especially if they have a large prostate, then it tends to increase even further your sampling error. So if you're just doing a sampling biopsy or try to do cognitive function, you're never going to stick the needle so far in to reach the anterior gland that you think you are. So unless you're doing one of these fusion systems that you're really seeing the lesion there in real time and you're going after it, sometimes you're really scared how far in you have to go in to reach the, 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 the lesion that you're targeting. So it really, really makes a difference. And unfortunately, we cannot just target the lesion. We have to still sample the whole prostate, but you know, the targeting is probably the, the, the most important component in this case. So to dovetail with that, what about perineal biopsies? That's a good thoughts? question. So. Um, Let's talk about the next case. <laughs> All right, so 69-year-old uh, gentleman, I'm going to defer that question to this case. Uh, with uh, BPH, moderate LUTs, he has, uh, tam he's on tamsulosin. Uh, he was previously diagnosed with very low risk prostate cancer uh, on active surveillance for three years, but his PSA continues to rise. It's a, a little concerning that, that uh, his PSA is rising in this way. Uh, on further review, his uh, his, actually, his, his most recent biopsy uh, was negative, uh, other than uh, at the left apex, some rare atypical glands, uh, highly suspicious for focal adenocarcinoma. Physical exam, uh, he does have an enlarged prostate, no, um, no nodules, uh, um, though, however. So, um, you know, this is a question to the field. Uh, you have this gentleman with, you know, a concerning trend in his PSA, very low risk uh, d disease, negative uh, biopsy on his most recent surveillance biopsy. Um, what would be your next step? You know, I, I guess a question to the panel. Well, if you never had an uh, MRI before, I think now is the time to do it. Right, and, and I agree with you. I think that the concern is that you're undersampling an area that, that might be harboring 
uh, prostate cancer. So uh, as you can see, this gentleman uh, is not probably emptying quite that well. His, his uh, bladder is very large and distended, but he has a region uh, here very anterior away from the rectum uh, that is, uh, has signal loss on the diffusion-weighted imaging. Uh, he has this median lobe as well. So this, this is the area that was called out uh, by the, uh, the radiologist, he calls it a PIRADS-4 lesion in the uh, anterior base transition zone, an area that would be traditionally very difficult to reach uh, with, a, with a transrectal approach. Um, so this was um, a biopsy that I did in fellowship uh, using a Coelus system. So Coelus uh, has a very nice transperineal approach. Um, you can target and simulate where the needle passes, um, and this becomes a very straightforward needle passage from the perineum to hit this very anterior lesion. Um, and you can see the targeting and the modeling of the prostate there. So. Uh, that comes back with uh, uh, four, three out of the four cores were involved with the highest grade group was one. Um, however, so the patient went for a decipher uh, score. He may, remains low risk on decipher and elected to continue active surveillance. So um, do either of you or any of the other panel members have experience with the transperineal approach? Yeah, so I think that this is becoming much more popular, especially with some of the data coming out of University of Michigan, the music collaboration, demonstrating, you know, safety of a transperineal approach. I will say that it is a little difficult on patients because um, passing a 18-gauge biopsy, core biopsy needle through the perineal skin, the perineal skin is, is tougher than a lot of skin that covers your body, and so it does require some pressure to do it. Um, you have to use local. There's some tips and tricks around it. Um, uh, to, to place the local on the perineum uh, in exactly the right spot for the needle passage, but um, uh, I think that it is a, a very valid and useful approach for some of these difficult to reach lesions. I would say from a historical standpoint, Dr. Cadman remembers the days when we used to do perineal 18 gauge true cut biopsies without visualization. We were doing with with digital guidance, uh, and that's that was done in the OR under anesthesia because of the discomfort that was uh, experienced by the patient. So we've come a long way since those days. Okay, so uh, we'll wrap this up with one more case of mine and then Dr. Kevin, you'll present your case. So uh, a 69-year-old African-American male, he's got multiple comorbidities, um, including a hemicolectomy, presented in 2018 with elevated PSA, um, no family history, small prostate, again, concerning uh, PSA density. Um, that continues to rise after uh, an initial biopsy showing only a small amount of greasing grade group one, 10% core involvement. Um, so at the confirmatory setting, we do the MRI of the prostate, and there were two small focal uh, lesions on T2, um, both pyrides four. Um, you can see these lesions are right here and right here, very central looking lesions uh, on this T2 weighted imaging. Uh, and you have your uh, uh, ADC map showing these very tiny lesions here. So uh, we targeted them um, using the urinav system with a transrectal approach because this is a, you know, a very, uh, is a peripheral lesion, but again, probably not in your typical systematic biopsy template because it's so central. Um, we were able to get those, and uh, lo and behold, he is harboring much higher risk disease in these very tiny lesions, so Gleason uh, 4 plus 5, grade group 5. However, there are additional cores that are also Gleason grade group 5 uh, in the systematic biopsy, again, uh, sort of reinforcing the, the thought that, you know, both of those two techniques are complementary. He elected to go on to radiation therapy. There. So I think that highlights, you know, several different uses of MRI fusion um, and uh, how you can uh, increase your diagnostic accuracy, your confirmatory biopsy accuracy using the complementary techniques. I'll turn it over to Dr. Cabin for his case discussion. Dr. Uh, Crawford, uh, last year at this meeting, talked a lot about the saturation technique using perineal biopsies. Uh, do do you, either of the panelists have comments on the number of biopsies that are required to adequately sample the gland? Is it, is it size-based, or uh, can, you, can you use a, an MRI targeting plus a systematic to ensure that you've got uh, adequate coverage? Uh, what are the thoughts? 
Yeah, that's interesting that you mentioned that. I was thinking, I was thinking about that too. You know, the number of cores that we target the lesions. There's also variation on that when you do target fusion biopsies. Uh, some people uh, go for four. Uh, there's some protocols for five, uh, but but uh, from NIU group and other groups, they tend to say minimum two. Uh, what we do to not end up doing too many cores, from, especially on small prostates, is just the standard cores. They're on the neighborhood of the lesion. You can move them. So they go and target you know, the air there's, there's in the neighborhood. And then you can add one or two additional in the air so you have at least two or three. Uh, I tend to get four targeted for each lesion, but sometimes the radiologists get really, really excited and you have three, four, or five targets in one <laughs> prostate. So you cannot add three extras you know, per target. You're not doing like a half prostatectomy by needle. So uh, uh, you have to be, you know, cognizant that you, how, how many cores you're taking, uh, uh, but, but of course, depending on the volume, you can dimension how many, you know, for the saturation, intentionally saturation biopsy, you have to measure and then, and then calculate uh, how many cores you take from that. Yeah, I think I, I have a similar thought process. I, I, I get nervous doing more than 18 cores in one setting transrectally, uh, so I try to limit it to 18 cores at the very, very most. Um, whether that's reducing, if there's a, several targets, reducing the number from, on, on the targeted biopsy from three to two, or if you have a patient that has had multiple systematic biopsies in the past and you have one or two areas that you want to biopsy, I, I switch to withholding the systematic biopsy in that one specific situation. Another strategy is focusing on the higher, higher uh, 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 pyrad score. Sometimes we have scores of four and five, and also have one or two you know, scores of three, so we have a higher number of cores, and the, of course the higher risk, and uh, you try to be a little more conservative on the pyrides three just because the risk, you know, it's statistically less. But we have to weigh risk and comfort, right? So the patient discomfort is one factor, but the risk of having a, a biopsy-associated infection and even neurosepsis goes up with the, the increased number of uh, biopsy samples, so there is a risk-benefit ratio that we have to, to weigh. I just wanted to add to that point the fact that the AUA doesn't support uh, rectal swabs, which showed a significant benefit in terms of decreasing, uh, you know, the risk of sepsis. What are your thoughts on that? Uh, we don't we don't have it available at the VA currently with our with our setup that we have. We have a lot of awesome, interesting, amazing, state of the art technologies, but not that one. Um, <laughs> I, I think it would be very if it would be very useful. <laughs> but we do everything we can in terms of antibiotic prophylaxis uh, to make the procedure as safe as possible for the patient without having. And you know, in Texas, fluoroquinolone resistance is very high, so um, that is an important consideration. Okay, so here's a patient. Um, this gentleman was 69 years old, a uh, white gentleman. He presented in June 2018. His PSA was 3.4, 14% free. His PHI was 28. We use PHI in my practice quite a bit. Uh, rectal examination revealed just BPH, probably around 50 milliliters. Uh, but he was a VIP, he was the mayor of a small town near Houston, uh, so um, even though I didn't believe that he has anything serious, I sent him for an MRI. Well, lo and behold, the MRI comes back with a Pyrad 5 right base, and the total volume was similar to what I estimated at 60 milliliters. So he had a fusion biopsy, and the only area, and I do the biopsy plus the 12 random systematic cores. The only area that was positive was one core in the region of interest, which had five millimeters of Gleason 3 plus 3. The rest was negative. Okay, discussion and decision, we talked about it, and we chose active surveillance because, number one, it's group one prostate cancer in terms of risk. Number two, it's a limited volume of disease. The patient did not have a family history of prostate cancer. He was Caucasian, and he was asymptomatic with good bladder and erectile function and was interested in preserving those functions. Follow-up comes back in July of 2019. That's a year later. Uh, lo and behold, he was diagnosed with pharyngeal squamous cell cancer with cervical metastasis. Uh, he was treated intensely with chemoradiation, 
At that time, his PSA is 4.4, 16% free, PHI 32, again, 17% risk. Not much, dif not much different from before. A rectal exam again shows uh, just BPH, no new symptoms, uh, decision, continued active surveillance. Follow-up in January of 2020, his PSA is now 5.6, 15% free. PHI jumped to a different category of 33% risk. Exam is normal, uh, no new GL symptoms. Uh, discussion, we continued, um, we selected to continue with active surveillance and follow-up in six months. Follow-up in July 2020, six months later, PSA continues to rise, 13% free. PHI, uh, within the PHI, it uh, is a little higher, but this is still the category of 33% risk. Exam is normal, no new GU symptoms. And at this point, due to the persistent rise in PSA and PHI over 18 months, we decided to repeat the MRI, or at least that was recommended. Uh, he agreed, but a few weeks later, he called and said he wanted to wait another six months. So patient input is also important in all those decisions. Follow-up in January 21, PH, PSA continued to rise 8.5, 11% free. It's approaching the 10% and below. PHI 44, still in the 33% uh, zone. So at this point, he had a repeat prostate MRI. Uh, the volume was 66 milliliters. Uh, he had pyrid 5 in the right base. Now, compared to the previous MRI, it increased in size. The previous was 2. Uh, the MRI suggested no extracapsular extension, neurovascular bundle invasion, or lymphadenopathy in the pelvis. He had a fusion biopsy and a 12 random systematic uh, core biopsy. Three cores from the ROI now show Gleason 3 plus 4, each one between 5 and 6 millimeters. The random systematic biopsies are still negative. So treatment considerations. Uh, at this point, medical oncology, we contacted them. They declared him a cure from the head and neck cancer with an excellent 10-year uh, prognosis. Uh, staging, he had no evidence of extraprostatic spread. Radiation or surgery are now considered viable options in this gentleman, were discussed at length. Uh, he still decided about his choice. Um, Any comments? Yeah, so I would say that this is an excellent scenario for using genomic testing. So uh, either Decipher, Oncotype DX, uh, Prolaris, send one of those. Uh, not only does that help you with uh, patient counseling in terms of just being able to provide them with an understanding of their individualized risk, but it helps you in decision making too, really deciding if, if there's the genomic alterations there that make this uh, as concerning as the growth on the MRI uh, sort of demonstrated. Yeah, so one, one thing that is important is the um, MRI is not, the, the PIRED classification is not made for longitudinal follow-up. So there's another, other tools that are being developed for that, but it's not a, a quantitative type of assessment. So uh, you should not think of MRI and the PIRED uh, scoring as a serial uh, uh, testing as a biomarker, and if it gets worse or you know, increase the PIRED score or increase the volume, as a criteria for you to do anything. It, it helps in, in, to localize, it helps to improve the accuracy of your, bi your biopsy, but it's not designed for repeated serial longitudinal uh, testing. So this is just an important you know, concept to have. In this case, it was used to help localize the lesion, target the lesion before the biopsy, and I think it was perfectly uh, uh, fine. I was gonna ask you, Dr. Godoy, since you gave us a, a lot of information about uh, potential tools to help us in these sorts of uh, patients. You know, we have a lot of patients that have this PSA anxiety that are in active surveillance. So they, they don't wanna have an intervention, but at the same time, with a rising PSA especially, it makes them very anxious. And uh, we are trying to help them uh, be comfortable with that decision. And so which of the blood tests uh, which of the urine tests and which of the genomic tests that Dr. Brooks mentioned are, are most common in your practice uh, to help with, uh, with the, the PSA anxiety issue in, in the active surveillance patient? So in the active surveillance, if they already have the diagnosis of cancer, then, then you can use, just like Dr. Brooks mentioned, there's the test overlap, so you can use different tests. 
uh, I think the Prolaris tend to be more used on patients on a very low risk or low risk category for patients who are really anxious in doing nothing and just keeping on active surveillance. That can give them reassurance that molecularly that tumor is, is, is not that aggressive. Uh, Oncotype can use in that space as well. If you're looking to more gray areas on a high volume, low grade disease, so there's not very low risk anymore. They're low risk of a high volume uh, group grade one, or if they have a very low volume, uh, favorable intermediate risk, which is also borderline for you to continue active surveillance, that's the perfect indication to use one of those tests because then we'll, we'll drive the balance one way or another. So we'll give the patient reassurance and you have more more information to, to you know carry the informed discussion. I just want to point out one more thing. And, um, obviously, Dr. Cabin made some very wise decisions in terms of this patient's care. And, and one is just not losing the, the forest for the trees. So clearly, having an understanding of the patient's life expectancy and other, you know, potentially life-limiting medical problems is, is always one of the most important things when counseling these patients. Um, I just wanted to make a few points. Um, and like the title says, kind of trying to integrate experience, common sense, and literature. So those are points that I believe are important in an active surveillance protocol. First of all, integrating the prostate MRI is imperative in my view. The MRI is important both when starting the active surveillance and in follow-up. Um, well, we're not necessarily comparing pyrad grades, but we're comparing size. And this is a classic example where you can see it. Uh, if MRI and effusion biopsy were part of the initial workup, the rationale for a confirmatory biopsy is, in my view, diminished. Uh, by the way, patients don't necessarily like those uh, biopsies. Um, and it, it's kind of invasive. And if you try to avoid a biopsy um, and have the uh, justification for avoiding it, the patient would certainly appreciate it. Now, the, finally, the MRI is not infallible. Uh, even in the follow-up, MRI is negative, but there is a strong suspicion based on markers, uh, like cases that were presented here. Then a regular follow-up biopsy, in my view, is absolutely justified. Follow-up biopsies should be done for a reason. I simply do not do them uh, based on an arbitrary uh, number of years. One year, two years, three years, but if there is a reason, I would definitely do it. If I'm not comfortable with the initial biopsy, if I'm not the one who did it, and it was just a random systematic biopsies, I would do a confirmatory biopsy. Um, finally, a fusion biopsy and a random systematic biopsies, like we mentioned before, are complementary, and I want to reiterate that it should be carried out simultaneously. Now, uh, just four comments about the MRI. Uh, MRI is not the same MRI depending on the practice and your environment. Uh, first of all, there are different equipments. Uh, there is a, was your MRI done on a 1.5 Tesla, 3 Tesla, was a rectal probe um, involved or not? Uh, and you need to find out those details because that basically um, may change your reliability and your reliance on the MRI. Is there a consistent protocol in a place where you practice? Is the Department of Radiology following the same protocol? Does it have a dedicated technician? Uh, is there an experienced designated radiologist who reads the MRIs, or is it uh, distributed among three or four or five radiologists with no particular expertise? Uh, does the program, the radiology program, have a quality improvement feedback loop? Does the radiology talk to the urologist, are there conferences with urologists, pathologists to see how right or wrong they were. All those factors are important. So an MRI is not always an MRI. It depends on the circumstances. 